My goal is not to offend people. My goal is to transmit knowledge. If I do that, uh, if I offend anybody in, in the interim, that wasn't my goal, um, but we can work through it. So <clears throat> the presentation that I have before you tonight, uh, I'm proposing that uh, this idea of postmodernism, and I, we will break down what that is, along with wokeism, we will break down what that is as well, is a new world religion. It is creeping into our society. Um, I was actually speaking with somebody the other day, and uh, this gentleman told me, we started talking about this briefly, and he's like, you know, I just want to stay out of that. I, I, I don't really, you know, I don't want anything to do with it. It's not really, in a, you know, affecting me. And I think that's what a lot of people think. Uh, on the contrary, though, this is a topic that affects everybody. And I will, <clears throat> I'll try to lay that out and, and show you in this presentation. And, um... Uh, I just, I also want to mention that uh, I do not believe in postmodernism. I, I believe, I believe it is a false ideology, um, and I am a Christian. I am a born again Christian. I am a Bible believing Christian, and so my my view uh, is that of a biblical Christian. And I I will uh, show you in the Bible, going walking through the Bible, some of the. Um, some of the ways which I feel like we can respond to this this movement, which is postmodernism or wokeism, and um, I just want to ask a couple people in the group right now: uh, Has anybody heard the term inter intersectionality before? No. Okay. I'm just kind of getting a little stuck for where you guys are at. Uh, has anybody heard the term postmodernism? Good. <laughs> Uh, and referring to art, yeah, that's good. Um, how about in the political uh, realm or aspect? Has anybody heard that term? Okay. Um, how about being woke? Unfortunately. Yeah, you guys, you guys have heard that. Okay. How about critical race theory? Yeah, a lot of hands go. And how about identity politics? Okay. So th those are. Postmodernism kind of encompasses all of those subjects. And um, I'm just going to give you a quick story about myself and a little bit about how I became a Christian. Uh, I am a recovered drug addict and alcoholic. I've been sober for a little bit over 12 years. It's a big part of me becoming a Christian. And um, I would say up until 2010, I lived a very promiscuous, sexually promiscuous lifestyle. I lived a, a debaucherous lifestyle um, and a moral lifestyle uh, in every facet and every way. And uh, I reached an end point of myself sometime in 2010. Uh, I was in a very public car accident uh, while drinking and driving and high on drugs. And I <clears throat> um, ended up in the newspapers. Base was in the uh, Chicago Tribune, uh, car on WGN News, and total embarrassment for me. And I had reached the end of myself, I would say. I had, dr I had drank a drug for roughly 17 years, and I, I just, I didn't know who could save me. I didn't know who could change me. And a close friend of mine had told me to go back to church. So. Uh, I ended up going to Willow Creek, Chicago, and I remember hearing the preacher in a way that I never heard him before, because I grew up in my dad in a Christian household, and what began to happen was in sometime in the, in March of 2010, I had just, I didn't want to live my life anymore. I became suicidal, and I just, I really felt like like I didn't want to live anymore. And um, I had an idea, I, you know, it's like, what's the point of uh, killing myself if, you know, I've heard this idea of just giving my life to God. And then a very, I mean, with every cell in my body and a very uh, just surrendered surrender, I don't know how else to put it, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And the next day I woke up and it's very hard for me to tell you into words how I had changed. And I can tell you in several ways, though. I had a distinct presence of God, whereas God was a theory 
up until that point, I felt his presence. And I believe what they call that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, and I felt that. And I felt that in a very physical way. And it was a very joyful feeling. Um, I also um, had an acute understanding of evil and righteousness, of what was good and what was, and what was wrong. And I would hear songs in the radio, you know, on like B96 or some station that I listened to, and they would be singing about some broken romantic relationship, and I just, I couldn't even listen to it because it was just evil to my ears. And not everybody has to have this experience to be a Christian, right? Um, but the point of what I'm, I guess the point that I'm driving home is that I had this sudden rearrange, this shift of ideas. I was awakened to God's kingdom, okay? And that is a true awakening. That's what we've called in the Christian church for 2,000 years, uh, what Jesus said, unless a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, which means that we cannot see the things of God until we become awakened, right? This turn has been hijacked by political ideologists within our, our culture, and that's what we're going to talk about. Um, this, this term of, of being woke, our modern... Our friends in the modern day woke movement have essentially um, made this political movement into a spiritual religious movement. And they have activated in multiple levels of our society, whether that is in the corporate level, whether that is in the schools, um, or just on the media. It's everywhere now. So with that, we'll get into a little bit of the presentation. So what is religion? Religion is a belief in and the worship of a superhuman controlling power, especially a personal god or gods. The, secondly, a pursuit or interest to which someone ascribes supreme importance and or a cause or principle or system of beliefs held which, with ardor or faith. And this is probably the third uh, definition there is uh, this one probably lands on where a lot of postmodernists or woke or people who are woke uh, landed. So, in order to understand postmodernism, we have to understand what um, uh, modernism is and the Enlightenment. So, the Enlightenment and modernism is defined by a belief in an objective knowledge, universal truth, science, and evidence as a method of obtaining objective knowledge. Modernists believe in the power of reason, the ability to communicate straightforwardly with language, and a universal human nature and individualism. So probably what a lot of people in this room have been taught since they were a kid. Christianity and modernism share some similar truths and beliefs and thus can coexist for the, for the most part. Christians believe in an objective knowledge, universal truth, as laid out in the Bible, reason, universal human nature, sin nature, and science. Many find this hard to believe, but many pioneers of modern science were Christians, like Descartes, Newton, Kepler, Galileo, Locke, Copernicus, Faraday, Kelvin, Pasteur, all Christians. And these were some of the modern day uh, fathers of science. And we are all coming out of this enlightenment, modernism, uh, phase, if you will, period, into a postmodern period. Applied postmodernism or wokeism began roughly around 2010, and its movement and is a movement we are examining today, and we're terming it wokeism. Christianity and applied modern postmodernism stand in opposition of each other in terms of their belief system. <coughs> so, what is postmodernism? The main pioneer of postmodernism philosophy came from a man named Michael Foucault. He was a philosopher that gained notoriety in the 60s and 70s, and he's been tremendously influential on postmodern thought, especially through his writings on power, knowledge, and uh, oppression. Postmodernist, postmodernism is defined by a radical skepticism about the accessibility of objective truth. Modernists do not see objective truth or or I'm sorry, modernists can see objective truth as something that exists and that can be approximated through processes such as expression, experimentation, falsification, and debate. Postmodern approaches to knowledge inflate a small, obvious kernel of truth that we are limited in our ability to know. They believe since, hum 
that since humans must express knowledge through language, concepts, and categories, that all claims to truth are value-laden constructs of, a, of culture. In other words, truth can only be evaluated through the eyes of one's culture as the primary determination of any possible truth, if that, possi if that truth even exists. And truth, it, in this sense, is not universal. So, and we call this cultural relativism, relativism, if you've ever heard that term. So essentially what this ideology is stating is that um, objective truth is not accessible, um, and that any sort of truth can only be understood or interpreted through one's culture. Everybody following? Okay. All right. All right. So, po what are some of the postmodernism principles? There's two principles and four themes. Two principles, four themes. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, Postmodern thinkers approach the rejection of modernism and enlightenment, um, enlightenment thought, especially with regard to universal truths, objective knowledge, and individuality in strikingly different ways. There are consistent themes, however. So the two postmodern principles, the postmodern knowledge principle is radical skepticism about whether objective knowledge or truth is obtainable and a commitment to cultural construct constructivism. Or cultural relativism. Postmodern uh, the postmodern political principle, a belief that society is formed of a of systems of power and hierarchies which decide what can be known and how. This is the genesis of modern day social justice movement or the woke movement. So um, we'll dive more into this, but really that uh, postmodern political principle is what is being activated today in our society. <coughs> And here are some of the, the four themes of postmodernism, <coughs> is the blurring of boundaries. These include not only boundaries between objective and subjective truth and belief, but also those between science and arts, reason versus feeling, uh, the natural and the artificial, high and low culture, man and other animals, man and machine, and between different understandings of sexuality and gender. Uh, and this is the genesis of gender fluidity theory. This is where you get people who think that there's 50 different types of genders out there. Um, and, and as well as what is health and what is sickness. Almost every social significant category has been intentionally complicated and problematized by postmodern theorists in, in order to deny such categories any objective validity and disrupt the systems of power that might exist across them. Everyone following? Okay. Give an example. <laughs> Give an example. Give it a try. All right. Um, the second theme is the power of language. Um, and to many postmodernists, language is believed to have enormous power to control society and how we think, and thus is inherently dangerous. Censorship is, is acceptable and encouraged and has become commonplace on social media now. I'm sure some of you guys have heard about the Twitter files that have come out recently, right? So this is this is what we're talking about. This is applied postmodernism. Language is dangerous. It needs to be controlled. We grew up in a society where, in order to obtain truth, a healthy debate should be had. And through that debate, even though I don't, I disagree with what you have to say. I can disagree with you and allow you to have your opinion. To postmodernists, you can't have your opinion. You can't have your your separate view because your your view might be oppression, the view of an oppressionist, and it must be censored and stopped. And and this this is this is infiltrating our, our culture and it's being activated today. Um, it's a bit frightening, actually, uh, and it is also seen. As an uh, language is seen as an unreliable way of producing and transmitting knowledge. The obsession with language is at the heart of postmodern thinking and the key to its methods. Political correctness was born out of postmodernism uh, through de deconstruction of language. So if you've ever had a friend, a coworker, a family member um, quickly correct you for saying something the wrong way or something subtly offensive or something like that, this is the genesis of that. This is where it all started. Okay, it's the de deconstruction of language. Language needs to be evaluated and nitpicked 
and um, and we, we need to make sure that you don't say the wrong thing because language has power in it. Uh, deconstruction of language rejects the common sense idea that words refer straightforwardly to things in the real world. Instead, deconstructionists insist that words refer only to other words and to, and to the ways in which they differ from one another. This unreliability of language means that it cannot represent reality or communicate it to others. Consequent, consequently, since debate and common knowledge on any given topic are believed to create and maintain oppression, they have to be carefully monitored and deconstructed. Again, political correctness, this is how I was born. In, in practice, Deconstructive approaches to language, therefore, look very much like nitpicking at words in order to deliberately miss the point. So, again, I'll just go back to any friend, family member, whoever, who corrects you for saying something politically incorrect that you probably had no clue or were not meaning to uh, say anything politically incorrect. Uh, postmodernist theme is cultural rel relativism. Postmodernists believe we cannot step outside our own system and categories and therefore have no vantage point from which to examine them. They insist that no one set of cultural norms can, is said to be better than any other. For postmodernists, any meaningful critique of culture's values and ethics from within a different culture is impossible, since each culture operates under a different concept of knowledge and speaks only from its own biases. So if you were to say that women can't drive in Saudi Arabia, and you, as a white whatever you are, um, you wouldn't be able to do that. Um, you wouldn't be able to say in Hindu culture that um, you know, the different sects that people are born into, um, the, you know, the different hierarchies in society, if you were to say that's wrong, you wouldn't be able to do that because you're a white male who lives in, or a female that lives in, in America. So just, Again, this idea that we can't look, you can't look at any other culture and objectively say that anything that they practice is wrong um, is, a, is a huge theme in, in postmodernism. In particular, criticism from any position deemed powerful tends to be dismissed because it is assumed either to be ignorant or dismissive of the realities of oppression or cynical attempt to serve the critic's own interests. Um, I skipped the point here. Um, all such critique is therefore wrong and at best moral infraction at worst, since it pre presupposes one's own culture to be objectively superior. This is why you've probably heard the term white supremacy more in the past five years than you ever have in your entire life. I, I, I would say up until 2016, I heard that term probably 15 times in my entire life. And I probably heard it 15 times in the past two months. So it, it's a big, it, this is an ideological push that um, any sort of uh, current system that we're in is a, a system of white supremacy. Um, and the final postmodern theme is the loss of the individual and the universal. To postmodern theorists, the notion of the autonomous individual is largely a myth. The individual, like everything else, is a product of powerful language and cultural uh, constructed knowledge. Equally, the concept of the universal, whether biological universal truth about human nature, like man and woman, or an ethical or universal, such as equal rights, freedom, opportunities for all individuals, regardless of class, race, gender, or sexuality, is at best naive. At worst, at worst it is merely another exercise in power knowledge, an attempt to enforce dominant knowledge on everybody. The postmodern view largely rejects both the smallest unit of society, the individual, and the largest humanity, and instead focuses on small local groups as the producers of knowledge, values, and discourse. Has anybody here heard the term lived experience? Yeah. So this is where this comes from. This idea of lived experience is that these small local groups, whoever that might be, LGBTQ, um, they have this lived experience, and because this experience is not talked about or expressed by other dominant groups in, in our culture, um, that uh, they somehow, the dominant uh, view within the culture is, um, is being oppressed and oppressive, and this other view 
therefore does not have enough visibility and needs to be elevated and amplified. Okay. Um, and where was I? Okay, so therefore postmodernism focuses on sets of people who are understood to be positioned in the same way by race, sex, or class, for example, and they have the same experience and perceptions due to the positioning. And this is where intersect this is what we call intersectionality. For a further classification of these people by victimhood status and works to elevate and amplify their, vo their voices over the perceived oppressor group. The most oppressive group is perceived to be white, Christian, heterosexual males. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. It doesn't make sense, but it makes sense, right? Okay, um, okay so now we're gonna talk about what I'm terming uh, applied postmodernism, okay? And this is the postmodern political uh, principle. This is uh, postmodernism basically in action. So postmodern political <laughs> principle is a belief that society is formed of systems of powers and hierarchies which decide what can be known and how. Postmodernism is characterized politically by its intense focus on power as the guiding and structuring force of society, a focus which is codependent on the denial of objective knowledge. Power and knowledge are seen as inextricably entwined. So power decides not only what is factually correct, but also what's morally good. Therefore, uh, there are no coordinated actors pulling the strings. Instead, we're all participants. Everybody in this room is a participant of this. Uh, um, this uh, postmodern theory then is a conspiracy theory where no conspirators in particular so, and this changes in an applied postmodernism or wokeism around 2010. So, this idea that it's kind of like you're, you guys ever seen the movie The Matrix? <laughs> so everybody's just kind of like in those pods and, and everybody's just kind of blind and they're part of that, that whole machine and the machines are using the energy. It, it's kind of think of it like that. that that's how I, I've always thought of it, right? Like, we're, we're all we're just in the system and most people don't even know until they're woke, until they are awakened in this system. So it is a social system and its inherent power dynamics that are seen as the causes of oppression, not necessarily willful individual agents. This is thus a society or social system or institution can be seen as in some way oppressive without any individual involved, without it needing to be shown to hold even a single oppressive view. So that's kind of complicated. Um, basically, if, even if we don't, if we aren't overtly racist or overtly pre prejudiced, everybody is still part of the system, and because we are a part of the system, we are all complicit in it until you awaken to it and fight against it. Make sense? Postmodernists do not necessarily see the system of repression as a result of consciously coordinated patriarchal white supremacist uh, heteronormative conspiracy. Instead, they regard it as the inevitable result of a self-perpetuating system that privileged some groups over others, which constitutes an unconscious, uncoordinated conspiracy inherent to systems involving power. They believe, however, that those systems are, are a patriarchal, white supremacist, and heteronormative and therefore necessarily grant unfair access to straight, white, Christian, Western men and work to maintain that status quo by excluding the perspectives of women and racial and sexual minorities. So there's a lot here. Basically, it's saying that the prevailing power system is, is that of white, Christian males, and that uh, white, Christian males act oppressively in suppressing other ideas. Uh, especially ideas of certain minorities, whether that's racial or sexual minorities. A central belief in postmodern political thought is that powerful forces in society essentially order society into categories and hierarchies that are organized to serve their own interests. They control this by dictating how, so how society and its features can be spoken about and what can be accepted as true, which is why they need to control language. Language needs to be controlled. 
Oppressive power structures constrain humanity and are deplored. This results in an ethical imperative to deconstruct, challenge, problematize, find and exaggerate the problems within, and resist all ways of thinking that support oppressive structures of power, the categories relevant to power structures, and the language that perpetuates them, thus embedding a value system, or a religion, if you will. The first postmodernists were largely reacting to the failure of Marxism. So this is where the, this ideology, they, you know, a lot of the atrocities of Marxism, you could talk about China and Russia, began to emerge and people saw how ineffective the, this, uh, you know, political system was and a lot of these philosophers began to uh, despair of it and that, that is kind of how postmodernism was born. So applied po uh, postmodernism, um, wokeism, uh, this begins around uh, 2010. And uh, around 2010, scholars and activists begin taking abstract postmodern ideas and making them into concrete objectives. Whoa, hold on. Here. Sorry, this looks like it's blocked out a little bit. I'm going to try to read it though. It says, the result is that the belief that society is structured of specific but largely invisible identity based systems of power and privilege that construct knowledge via ways of talking about things is now considered by social justice scholars and activists to be an objectively true statement, which is hypocritical considering that this ideology believes that there's no objective reality. Mm. <clears throat> and the organizing principle in society, wokeism itself can never be denied. Wokeism is real, so social justice scholarship, wokeism has become a kind of theory of everything a set of unquestionable truths with a capital T. Uh, and the form of general scholarship looks at marginalized groups and multiple systems of power and privilege. The theoretical premise that society works through systems of power and privilege maintained in language, and these create knowledge from the perspective of privilege and deny the experience of marginalized. You are either on, either on one side or the other. You are either privileged or marginalized. There's no in between. Patriarchy, white supremacy, imperialism, cis normativity, I can't even pronounce some of this stuff, heteronormativity, <laughs> ableism, and fat phobia are literally structuring society and infecting everything. They exist in a state of imminence, present always and everywhere, just beneath a nicer seeming surface that can't quite uh, keep them. Sorry, some of this stuff. Sorry. Try to read this. I don't know. Let's go. Oh, yeah. What's that? Which part are we at? The parallel. The bottom part. I don't know. This oh. kind of got meshed together here. Yeah, the line went over. So. Um, okay. Yeah. So basically, it's saying that sexism, racism are systems that can exist and oppress absent even a single person with racist or sexist intentions or beliefs. Sex is not biological and exists on a spectrum, which is where you get transgenderism. Um, and language can be literal violence. Denial of gender identity is killing people, and the wish to remedy disability is hateful. <clears throat> And um, society is permeated by white supremacy and that any disagreement with these ideas is a result of weakness that has been socialized into white people through their privilege. So if you don't agree with this as a white person, it's because you are so blind to it. You are so um, into your own whiteness that you cannot objectively um, get out of it unless you become old. And white people are complicit beneficiaries of racism and white supremacy. This is according to the social justice movement. Disagreement is not allowed. You cannot disagree. <coughs> disagreement would allow opposition and argument to be reasserted, voiced, and heard, which wokeism sees as not safe. Many people, especially academics, remain completely unaware of the depth of this problem, which presents as ideological closeness and an unwillingness to accept any disagreement. 
and an authoritarian will to enforce social justice con conception of society and a moral imperative on others. Perhaps what is most worrying about social justice scholarship is the increasing difficulty of speaking about issues relevant to social justice or about social justice scholarship itself in any way other than under its own inflexible terms. It treats uh, them as the truth and tolerates no dissent and expects everyone to agree or you will get canceled. Instead of science, social justice scholarship advocates for other ways of knowing, derived from theoretical interpretations of deeply felt lived experiences. If a minority views lived experience disagrees with science, that trumps that uh, scientific view. So how can Christians respond, right? We just went through a lot of information. That's uh, it's kind of hard to hear. Um, and But how do we as Christians respond to this? Uh, Christ, Christians must never compromise biblical truth, ever. Uh, Christians declare that the Bible is truth and guiding morality regardless of culture. And um, I'm going to read off some scripture verses. This is 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God breathed out by God and profit, profitable for teaching, for reproof, and for correction. And a man's problem is spiritual, not political. Christianity gives an account of creation in Genesis 1, what our problem is, and all have sinned and all fall short of God's glory in Romans 3.23. A solution, which is rec reconciliation with God through Jesus Christ, payment of sins on the cross. And we find that in 2 Corinthians 5.18. Our purpose here on earth, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And what happens after we die, which is eternal life for those who trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and eternal damnation for those who don't. And um, wokeness, social justice scholarship, and postmodernism don't address any of man's root problems. Only Jesus does that. We should not be surprised at what's happening in our culture. Uh, this has all happened before. Uh, so this is from Ecclesiastes 1.9. What has been will be again, and what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. This is not new. We think it's new, but it's not. Uh, this is from Judges 21.25. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. It kind of sounds very similar to this ideology. And this is from... Uh, uh, Pontius Pilate in John 18, 37, 38. He says, you are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth, retorted Pilate. So you have, you have a Pontius Pilate looking at truth incarnate and asking, what is truth? So we have the very same people in our culture right now asking, "What is it, you know? How can you say that there's any sort of truth?" And we look to Jesus as our truth. Um, and then finally, the Jewish people were looking for a political Messiah who delivered them from an oppressive power of the Romans. This it's not new. Again, I, you know, the, this ideology is political in nature, but. Um, you know, and the Jews were looking for a savior, but what God gave mankind was himself and a bodily form and is a spiritual savior. Jesus was the Lamb of God who took, took away the sins of the world. <coughs> the Bible makes it clear not to be deceived or led astray by this new ideology. Biblical justice and postmodern social justice stand in opposition to each other. Some deceived Christians are attempting to commingle them. Be careful. Be careful. It's out there. You have a lot of Christians who are trying to make this a biblical thing. Um, and for, uh, this is from uh, 2 Timothy 4. It says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside the nits. This ideology is infiltrating the, the church. Mm -hmm. And I, I would just say, be careful. Be mindful of what church you're going to. And don't be afraid to engage people that are trying to bring this forward in the church. Um, 
See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human traditions, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. And another uh, scripture verse is in 2 John 1, 7. It says, For many deceivers have gone out in the world for those who do not confess the coming of Lord Jesus in the flesh. Such a one is a deceiver and the Antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for. And then how can we relate Christianity or start a conversation with a woke individual? I think this is important, right? Because we have to engage people. Like, I work entirely in an environment. I am probably the only person of one political ideology of 300 people where I work. But I am able to coexist there. And I think as Christians, it's important for us to do that. We have to be able to, to uh, talk to people. We have to be able to share the gospel. Uh, Christians believe in an oppressive power in the world. That power is Satan. So we do believe that there is, there are hierarchies of power, that there is a power structure in this world. And that the greatest oppressor of all is, is Satan. And here's a, a scripture verse um, in, from Ephesians 6.12. It says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So in a sense, they're not far off, they, but they're attributing the, these power structures onto man-made power structures. And what we as Christians say is there are many things going on in the spiritual realm that we can't see. This, that's where the real fight is. And God hates oppression. Uh, let's be clear about that as Christians. Um, and so should Christians. If you're a Christian, you should hate oppression too, and you should try to fight against it. Uh, Proverbs 14, 13, 1. Those who oppress the poor insult their maker. Psalm 9, 9 says the Lord is a shelter to the oppressed. Psalm uh, 103, 6 says the Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. This oppression is defined through a biblical lens, though, not a social justice lens. And we can have a spiritual awakening, be truly woke, if you will, with faith and trust in, in Jesus Christ, and be filled with the Holy Spirit to combat this power that causes misery and suffering in this world versus a fake, woke political awakening that is man-made. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So more on this. Um, until this rebirth through the gospel happens, people cannot truly see or hear. Jesus says in Matthew 13, 13, that though seeing, they did not see, though hearing, they did not hear or understand. This idea of wokeism again, it's in the Bible. It, it was hijacked. Um, since social justice warriors have an affinity for deeply felt lived experiences, every Christian has a testimony to share, which, which is deeply felt lived experience with Christ. You heard about mine just before this. That's part of the reason why why I, 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 we should be doing this. We shouldn't be scared to tell people about what God has done for us personally, that we that we have felt His power in our lives. And, and we, I don't believe we're going to save all people, but we'll we'll help bring someone over to our side. Um, and uh, where was I? so. Oh, this is a, we must not underestimate this. The modern social justice movement values storytelling, the lived experience, and an opportunity, to, an opportunity to share the gospel with people. Also, Jesus commands us to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and to teach people what he taught the disciples. And furthermore, this is, this is further clarification that uh, cultural relativism does not apply to Jesus in this context. Because he's telling us, he's telling us to go to all nations and to teach them what he taught, regardless of what their culture is. And we see that Christianity is all throughout the world, whether it's in China and house churches or Africa. And, and so this is a global movement that moves across cultures. So, um, Cultures need to view themselves within the scope of God's view of what, what is right and wrong. It's not the opposite. Um, and Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9, To the Jews I became like a Jew, 
to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law. And I'm not going to read through this whole thing. Uh, but basically what Paul is saying here is that Paul would go to, to people how to meet them where they were at. So if they were a Jew, he'd go to them as a Jew. If they were a Gentile, he'd go to them as a Gentile. We need to talk to, to people who are woke, that are lost. These are lost people, they're woke, whatever. But we need to talk to them. We need to know what, what, what their interests are, what sets them off, what you know, push it, what pushes their buttons. And and by doing that, by by knowing what they believe, we can respond and, and share the gospel with them. Um, and if this reaches um, a dead end and um, and nothing changes, Jesus states, you'll be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. So don't be don't be scared of people dislike you for your belief system. They did to Jesus, they, they killed him. Um, and so we, we have to be prepared to, to do the same. Um, and, and we have to be able to, we have to, be able to um, tell the truth and not be scared of the repercussions. And uh, another thing it says, even if the world hates us and persecutes us for not believing their lives, Jesus commands, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So that's very important. Uh, we, need to love, we need to love them, even though they might be yelling, screaming, or doing whatever they are, they're doing. Uh, that's our job. And some final thoughts about biblical truth. Um, the Bible makes it clear that truth sets us free. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Uh, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So there is objective truth in the world. The, the Christian does believe in, in, in a, a hard truth, if you will. The disciple John writes that Jesus was full of grace and truth, which actually, I don't want to get in this whole thing here, but they actually thought that that was impossible in Jewish in old Jewish culture, that you couldn't simultaneously be filled with both. Um, and, and so we, we have a Savior that is grace and truth. Um, and gender is not fluid. God made two sexes, male and female. Science verifies two sexes. It's not a spectrum or many genders. And in Genesis 5, 2, he said he created them male and female, not 50 different genders. Um, Jesus affirmed marriage to be between a man and a woman, and that there are, and that there were two sexes. And he's, uh, Jesus says in Mark 10, 6, But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Amen. And um, <coughs> about homosexuality. Um, homosexuality, it always has been a sin in the Bible, and it always will be a sin. And uh, in Romans 1, 25 through 27, they exchange the truth, the truth about God, for a lie, and worship and serve created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in them, themselves the due penalty for their error. So we see how truth, right? They abandon truth, and then what happens after truth is abandoned? Sin comes thereafter. Uh, God's truth is immutable and never changes. Jesus Christ is the, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I want to thank you guys for bearing with me. That was a long, big mouthful. Um, 